<clears throat> Exodus chapter 20. So two weeks ago, we, we looked at the, first, or the seventh commandment. We're going to continue that this evening. So Exodus 20, verse 14, but I'll read the larger context beginning in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, uh, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Amen. So as I said, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. So last time we looked at the basis for the commandment. We saw the purpose of God in marriage. God ordained marriage. It's not a social convention. It wasn't the best possible arrangement that Adam and Eve could figure out, but rather it was designed by God. As well, we have the function of God's law, the Decalogue, the regulation of conduct on earth by God and he says specifically you shall not commit adultery and then the sanction involved in transgressing God's law so when those when persons violate or transgress the law of God there is repercussion there is sanction there is penalty attached to that and then we moved on to the prohibition of the commandment that's where we find ourselves tonight uh, the, the several things that we looked at last time obviously adultery is condemned that's having relationships Relations with somebody who is not your spouse, the spouse of another. Second is the act of fornication. That's having relations outside of the covenant of marriage. The third was incest, which is prohibited by God, both by consanguinity or blood and by affinity, relation. God prohibits in both areas. We saw fourthly the act of rape in Deuteronomy chapter 22. Fifth, homosexuality. It's not an alternate lifestyle to be celebrated. Rather, it is a sinful pattern condemned by God Most High. After that, we looked at bestiality and then unlawful divorce and then immodesty. So those are several things that we looked at. So we have just a few more tonight and then we'll look at the manner of violating the commandment. So picking up, the next one is the act of polygamy. Now the polygamy is having multiple wives. If you turn over to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 17, specifically, you see that God prohibited kings in particular from multiplying wives. Now, I know that there was polemic polygamy in the Old Testament. I know that it was practiced by David. It was certainly practiced by Solomon. In fact, 1 Kings chapter 11 is a sad commentary on the act of polygamy. But if you look at Deuteronomy 17 at verse 14, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in 
it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself nor cause the people who return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Now, the particular prohibition here respecting kings definitely, definitely applies to all men and all women. God made Adam and Eve. He didn't make Adam and Eve and then, you know, five other women and bring them to Adam. But the specific direction for kings is that oftentimes they married to forge political alliances. And no doubt that's what Solomon does as he takes on that multitude of extra wives, but they caused his heart to go astray from the living and true God. So that is prohibited by God. Now if you turn to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 21, you'll notice that God regulates polygamy. God regulates polygamy. And we might ask the question, why would he do that if it is a sinful thing? Well, it's similar to divorce. In an unfallen world, there would be no legislation dealing with divorce because there would be no divorce. But because of the fall into sin, there are sometimes innocent parties in a marriage and it is lawful for them to sue out for divorce. So after the fall, there comes legislation to redress specific things that arise among fallen sinners. So when you see laws respecting polygamy in the Old Testament, it's not to sanction the practice, it is rather to protect the innocent parties that are involved. Notice in uh, Exodus chapter tw uh, 21, specifically at verse 7, if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. Now notice, if he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. And if he does not do these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. Again, it's not to sanction the practice of polygamy, it's rather to regulate it so that innocent parties in that particular situation situation would be protected. But the act of polygamy was not God's intention at the original creation. The practice was tolerated in the Old Testament, but as Stuart mentions, monogamy is everywhere in Scripture assumed as the ideal. As a creation ordinance in Genesis 2.24 and then firmly reinforced by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 5, and then Paul in Ephesians 5 at verse 31. So the original intent by God at creation was one man and one woman forever until death did them part. Now again, because of sin, because of the, the attack upon the family that sometimes occurs because of wicked men, God gave divorce, for, for instance, a lawful divorce so that persons could be protected. Same thing with polygamy. It's not sanctioned, but it's regulated in the Old Testament so that innocent parties would be protected. That text. If a man takes another wife, he shall not diminish the first wife's food, clothing, and her marriage rights. In other words, he needs to make sure that her marriage bed, her cupboard, and her closet are filled just like they were prior to his taking on this additional wife. The next one is the act of prostitution. It's condemned by God as a sin. But in interestingly enough, in the Old Covenant, it wasn't a civil crime. Remember as an evidence that God answered Solomon's prayer for wisdom, two harlots come and present their case to, to Solomon concerning a living son. Solomon doesn't order them to be thrown into jail for harlotry. Solomon does not say off with their heads because they've committed this particular crime. So it wasn't a crime in Old Covenant Israel. It was certainly frowned upon as a practice, but in terms of sin, prostitution is condemned by God Most High. And then the, th uh, the next one tonight is pornography. There's no specific text that says, thou shalt not click on that website, but Matthew chapter 5, specifically the section dealing with adultery, Jesus underscores the reality that if you look upon a woman to lust, or if you're a woman and you look upon a man to lust, we forget 
that it goes that way as well, then you have broken the seventh commandment. And when it comes to pornography and the use of it, it is for that express purpose. Notice in Matthew 5.28, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Remember Jesus, uh, uh, the antithesis here is not between Jesus and Moses. When he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old by Moses, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you. That's not the antithesis of the contrast. Moses or the law under Moses always spoke to the heart of man as well. It was wrong in the old covenant to lust after a woman. It was wrong in the old covenant to lust after a man. The antithesis of the contrast is between Jesus and the Pharisaic and uh, scribal misinterpreters of Moses. They taught that as long as you didn't engage in the outward act, then you were okay. Jesus says, no, if you engage in it inwardly, you have violated or transgressed the commandment. And again, all the Old Testament or the Old Testament underscores that same thing. It was never right. Remember, Job made a covenant with his eyes, according to Job 31. Why then should he look upon a young woman? If it was not sin, unless he actually engaged in the act, why would he make that covenant with his eyes? So back to the text. Notice in verse 28, I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members sh uh, perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And then over at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Again, a general prohibition. Certainly we can extend it to the use of pornography. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 at verse 3. Paul says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. The word there is porneia. And it's a broad term. And it's all inclusive or comprehensive in terms of all manner of sexual sin. Jesus uses that same language there in Matthew 5 and then he uses it again in Matthew chapter 19. When he argues for the lawfulness of divorce he uses that broader word porneia. The word for adultery is moikeia. He doesn't say if somebody is guilty of adultery therefore you have the ability or you have the right to sue for divorce. He uses that broader term. He uses the language of porneia. It's a broader category and there's a whole host of things covered by that particular commandment. And then the final one, we're going to spend a little bit more time on this just because of its prevalence in our own generation, and that's transgenderism. You can turn over to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22 deals specifically with transvestitism which is simply dressing like the opposite sex. And then, of course, transgenderism is trying to be like the opposite sex via either chemical and or surgical means. So notice in Deuteronomy 22 at verse 5, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. I realize this is often applied to women not wearing trousers, but if that is what it means, then women shouldn't wear socks or shirts because men wear socks and men wear shirts. The clear prohibition is against transvestitism. One commentator said, almost certainly it is about the perverted crossing of genders, either in orgiastic rites involving trans, uh, transvestitism or in some form of pagan worship or both. The final phrase of the law shows that some form of serious immorality or idolatry was involved. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. For willing to apply that to a woman wearing pants, I think we're missing the point of the text. The point of the text is transvestitism. Again, in that culture, it was a man trying to pass as a woman or as a woman trying to pass as a man. And then we've had transvestitism in our own generation, but it's evolved into the chemical expression
expression or into the surgical expression known as transgenderism. Now this is obviously appropriate for us to be concerned about. As I said, it's very prevalent today. I'm going to read a few statistics here concerning the situation that we are facing. But first, Bill C-4, which was recently uh, passed in Canada. And the preamble to Bill C-4 says, whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because among other things it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender uh, gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. Well, if that's true, it's not just the Bible that's a myth, and that's what they're ultimately trying to do, but it's science. To say that somehow heterosexuality, to say that somehow these things that have been settled science for millennia is fluid and it doesn't really mean what it means is really a, a, a launch into superstition and voodoo and a whole host of things that are completely anti-science. Uh, uh, With reference to transgenderism, there is is a, a craze among girls today. Adolescent girls are transitioning to boyhood in a way that has never been seen before. This ought to concern us. There's a book by Abigail Schreier. It's called Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. Listen to just a couple of these statistics. She says that gender dysphoria, formerly known as, formerly known as gender identity disorder, is characterized Characterized by a severe and persistent discomfort in one's biological sex. It typically begins in early childhood, ages two to four, though it may grow more severe in adolescence. But in most cases, nearly 70% childhood gender dysphoria resolves. Historically, it afflicted a tiny sliver of the population, roughly 0.01%, and almost exclusively boys. Before 2012, in fact, there was no scientific literature on girls ages 11 to 21 ever having developed gender dysphoria at all. In the last decade, that has changed and dramatically. The Western world has seen a sudden surge of adolescents claiming to have gender dysphoria and self-identifying as transgender. For the first time in medical history, natal girls are not only present among those so identifying, they constitute the majority. And then this stat, in the last decade, so we're talking about the last 10 years, think about this, and I know this is prevalent, I know we're inundated with it, but we need to think biblically about this because they're trying to get us to accept an absurdity. They're trying to make the absurd normal. They're trying to demonize those of us who say that it's absurd instead of succumbing and saying that it's normal. In other words, they are anti-persons who say that two plus two equals four. They are are most encouraging this two plus two equals five response on the part of the body politic. So in the last decade, again, 10 years, adolescent gender dysphoria has surged across the West. In the United States, the prevalence has increased by over 1,000%. 1,000 percent. She goes on to say 2% of high school students now identify as transgender, according to a 2017 survey of teens issued by the CDC. In Britain, the increase is 4,000%, and three quarters of those referred for gender treatment are girls. Now, brethren, it is incredibly easy for them to go about this, to get testosterone, to have what's called top surgery, to effectively sterilize themselves with reference to any having, uh, ability of having babies in the future. Consider these statistics with reference to the LGBTQ situation. Uh, there was a recent study that was conducted, and it said that the, uh, the, the study revealed that while LGBT identification has been stable in older generations, it has risen significantly in younger generations. Over 20% of Gen Z adults, 
Now, Gen Z are persons born from 1997. So they're in that window of 1997 to about 2012. So 20% of Gen Z adults identify as LGBTQ in some form or another. Now contrast that with 2.6% of baby boomers. So baby boomer, boomer, boomers were born between 1946 and that generation ended at 1964. Then you have Gen X, which is 1965 to 1980. Gen X is uh, about 4.5%. So you're seeing quadruple numbers in our generation. Now, it could just be because the liberty and freedom of the sexual revolution has finally come upon us, or it could be because they're actively promoting and actively pushing this. And if you read that book by Abigail Schreier, it is horrifying the way that public schools in particular are very careful to protect the gender transition of children when it comes to their parents. Parents. There are things being done and parents aren't even being notified with reference to their children uh, uh, transitioning to another gender. You've heard about the current situation in Florida, the don't say gay bill. Everybody's heard of that? The bill says nothing about don't say gay. The word gay is not in the bill. That has been taken up on the part of the opponents of the bill to try to silence anybody from advocating that particular position. The bill is quite simple. The bill simply says that a school district may not encourage classroom discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity in primary grade levels or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students. Basically the window is from pre-K to nine years old. That's what Ron DeSantis wants in Florida. All he did was pass a bill that said, I don't want any teachers of children who are pre-K to nine years old to have to hear about sex, about gender identity, about sexuality. That the opponents of this are losing their mind indicates the problem we are facing today. It indicates that this kind of stuff is being used as a bludgeon against not only our children but against political enemies as well. One person said Democrats say such policies will harm the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. The Florida measure bars classroom instruction in public schools on sexual orientation or gender identity for children in kindergarten through third grade or from about ages five to nine. Who in their right mind would oppose that law? Who in their right mind wants their five to nine year old to be discussing sexual issues with their public school teacher? We have an epidemic today or a pandemic and it ain't COVID. We have a pandemic of sexual perversion that is openly promoted. And as I said before, it's not just enough for us to, to, to accept it as normal. It's getting to the point where we need to praise that as the optimum way to go. So they're going from just we want to be accepted to if you don't do this, you've got big problems. They are grooming children. They are after our children. I think Matt Walsh was right. You got to get them when they're that young because when they hit the you know 10 to 15, they're smart enough to know how stupid it all is. So you got to really go after them when they're little children. And they understand that. And the fact that this bill in Florida, you, you should all see what the problem is with that bill in Florida, it doesn't go near far enough. It shouldn't just be nine-year-olds that shouldn't have to hear. I don't want my 15-year-old, if my 17-year-old was at uh, you know, in a, in a public high school. I wouldn't want his gay teacher celebrating the gay in front of him. That's not reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's what they're there for, allegedly. Not to be trained to embrace sexual perversion and to engage in transition against or without their parents' knowledge. So if you have a mind to, to read and see kind of what's going on, I, I commend that book by, by Abigail Schreier, 
irreversible damage, the transgender craze seducing our daughters. It really is horrifying to consider the implications and the ramifications. Kind of like getting a tattoo when you're 15, only you can get the tattoo lasered off. You can't become fertile again. You can't get you know, your breast replaced. There's a whole host of lifelong implications for persons who choose to transition. And it is not, as far as I can tell, a happy life. And typically, and as the, 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 the data shows, it's not like that fix any, fixes any mental health issues. It just brings on new ones. There's new issues that one has to process and one has to deal with when it comes to this particular thing. So in Deuteronomy 22 verse 5, it doesn't speak of actually, you know, chemical or surgical, but the prohibition is there. If God made you a man, you're a man. If God made you a woman, you're a woman. You're not supposed to try and correct that. You're not supposed to try and change that. You're not supposed to try to go against nature. God knows what he's doing when he designs us, and as a result, we embrace what God has made us to be, and in in that we seek to be faithful in terms of our, our sexuality. So those are several things that are prohibited by the commandment. Again, it's comprehensive. You shall not commit adultery. But as we've seen, a method of interpretation is that all, uh, uh, all the sins of a particular category are subsumed under that particular uh, uh, commandment. So adultery, fornication, incest, rape, homosexuality, bestiality, unlawful divorce, immodesty, polygamy, prostitution, pornography, and then transvestitism and transgenderism. And of course, we, we see the transgender application in society as well in terms of, of female sports. Men are killing it at female sports. I mean, they are, you know, putting the hurt on these, on these women athletes and it's just so unfair. It, it's just so not cool. Could you imagine being an NCAA double, uh, AA champion woman swimmer to be bested by a man and everybody saying, but that's okay? That's simply acceptable? That's fine? I mean, the guy's two feet taller. He's got, you know, the, the, the wingspan of an eagle. He's got testosterone. He's able to swim faster. It's just the way it is. So there is some really unfair things going on in the name of sexual freedom or liberty, which is ultimately just bondage and slavery. So those are the, that's the prohibition. Now, in terms of the manner of, of violating the commandment, of course, the external act, engaging in any of these is forbidden. The Westminster Larger Catechism says, what are the sins forbidden in the Seventh Commandment? The sins forbidden in the Seventh Commandment, besides the neglect of the duties required, are adultery, fornication, rape, incest, sodomy, and all unnatural lusts. So engaging in these things externally, actually practicing these particular things that fall under the prohibition, you shall not commit adultery. But secondly, and we see this in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter 5, it's that in internal disposition. Matthew chapter 5, the Lord Jesus says, if you look upon a woman to lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And again, this is prohibited in Job 31. You see it in Proverbs chapter 6 and as well in Proverbs chapter 7. The larger catechism goes on to say all unclean imaginations, thoughts, purposes, and affections. With reference to Matthew 5.28, Spurgeon says if sin were not allowed in the mind, it would never be made manifest in the body. This, therefore, is a very effectual way of dealing with the evil. Cut it off before it gets into the mind. Don't entertain it. Don't ponder it. Don't contemplate it. Rather, resist it and reject it in the light of Jesus' words. Well, I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Watson said, as a man may die of an inward bleeding, so he may be damned for the inward boilings of lust if it not be mortified. So certainly the external actions and then the internal disposition. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. It also deals with corrupt and filthy speech. Ephesians chapter 5, specifically at verse 3. Notice how Paul makes this prohibition and he includes alongside the external act and the internal disposition the kind of speech that is 
unfitting uh, 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 obedience to the seventh commandment. So chapter 5 in Ephesians at verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, uh, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. And then a final way is the association with idleness, gluttony, and drunkenness. Again, the catechism goes on to say, idleness, drunkenness, uh, uh, gluttony, drunkenness, unchaste company. I think the reason the catechism addresses that is because a failure to govern every passion often yields uh, uh, a problem with, with any passion. If we're not on guard across the board, then typically we sub uh, 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 succumb to various temptations and lusts in other arenas. And then in terms of the positive aspect, of the command. So it's a negative, do not commit adultery, but positively, what are we to learn? Again, I'm going to lean on the larger catechism. What are the duties required in the seventh commandment? The duties required in the seventh commandment are chastity in body, mind, affections, words, and behavior, and the preservation of it in ourselves and others, watchfulness over the eyes and all the senses, temperance, keeping of chaste company, modesty and apparel, marriage by those that have not the gift of continency, conjugal love and cohabitation, diligent labor in our callings, shunning all occasions of uncleanness, and resisting temptations thereunto. So positively, there's a lot there. Positively, there's a lot going on in terms of watchful in terms of care and concern about our, uh, the presentation, the way that we live and the way that we function. And then it enjoins uh, happy marriages. The best corrective, and our confession deals with it at the level of prevention of uncleanness, is to find a good husband or a good wife and enjoy relations in the context that God designed it for. Se uh, sexuality is not a sin. God's not, you know, uh, against the act. God is against the act outside of its covenant context context and the boundary of marriage. Within the context of marriage, it is a good thing. In fact, you can turn to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5, Solomon gives his sons the three R's to sexual purity. And for Solomon, the first is remove. Remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house with reference to the woman that would entice. Notice in Proverbs 5 at verse 8. Remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. The second R is found in verse 18. Notice, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. What's the corrective with reference to uncleanness? You have a good wife or a good husband. You enjoy the blessings that God has granted to you with that particular person. And then the third R is verse 21. There's not an R word there, but it's remember. For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. Remember, whatever you're doing, wherever you go, whoever you're looking at, whatever you're thinking about, the Lord God examines. The Lord God ponders all his paths. So remove your way far from from her, rejoice in the wife of your youth, and remember that God Most High is watching your actions and He knows the internal disposition. So in terms of some concrete application, that first is the means for protection. The perp uh, 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 marriage, and we have several purposes for marriage. It's not just sexual relations, but that is an aspect of marriage that God has given in Genesis chapter 2. You see it as well, in, as I said, in Proverbs chapter 5. You see it in Hebrews chapter 13. It's a good thing. Sexuality is a blessed gift from God Almighty. It's just supposed to be used the way that God Almighty specifies. We're not supposed to turn it on its head and engage in it in a manner 
manner that is inconsistent with God's holy word. Now with reference to the rejection of the seventh commandment, we see the prevalence of this in North American culture. We see it in spades. I mean, it's in other cultures to be sure, but certainly we see it present in our own culture, uh, not just transgenderism, but the celebration of all manner of sexual perversity. Again, they want to normalize things. They want to make it such that, that this is just the common approach to sexuality. Do whatever it is you want. Well, that's not what God says. God never says, do whatever it is you want. You've seen the dust up with Disney recently. Disney opposed Ron DeSantis' bill in Florida. Disney has been hurt, or uh, a higher up in Disney has said they want to try to get 50% LGBTQ into their, you know, coming movies. It's, it's horrifying. And again, they don't like to be called groomers. Well, I've got a great, great response for you. Stop grooming our children, and we won't call you groomers. That's the way you avoid that. You don't sexualize seven-year-olds. You don't sexualize ten-year-olds. Let them be children. Let them play, you know, cops and robbers. Let them play hide and seek. I mean, some of us grew up in a day and age where we didn't have to hear about all that stuff when we were kids. We just did what kids are supposed to do. They are sexualizing children at a very young age, and it really should concern the people of God. But it's prevalent not only in North American culture, it's prevalent in the professing church. Unlawful divorce, the acceptance of homosexuality, and the avoiding of sexual ethics altogether. Brethren, this is a, 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 a hill to die on for us. We are not to, to, to fumble the ball at the point of sexuality with reference to God's holy word. We're not supposed to capitulate. We're not supposed to model those churches that say, well, as long as it's monogamous homosexuality, it's not promiscuous as long as those men are faithful one to another. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible condemns it as perversion. The Bible condemns it as sin. And therefore, the church must uphold that. And then as well, the interference of the civil government in matters of sexuality. The civil government exists to defend the citizenry. The civil government exists to protect us from murderers in society and to protect us from invaders coming across our border. That's it. They shouldn't be in the business of transitioning children. The head of the Department of Health and Human Services was asked today if he thought that the federal government in the United States of America should be in the business of subsidizing transition among little children, and he said yes that we have gotten to the point where federal tax dollars are being spent to mutilate children and somehow we think this is good? You know how they say history is going to deal with us very severely and very harshly? I can't even imagine how it's going to go when you look back on a society of people where adults encouraged children to pursue self-mutilation. Adults encouraged children. There's a process or there's a program that, that, that's high among the school of thought in terms of transitioning that never ever question them or challenge them. They know what's best. Little Susie at 13 knows her sexuality. She knows that she was made to be a boy. And you have to respect that. And you have to pay for her testosterone. And you have to pay for her top surgery so that she can transition and be happy and healthy as a boy. I'm sorry. Get the government out of sexuality. Get the government out of our lives except at the point of protecting us. The passage of B Bill C-4, along with all of the COVID statutes of the last two years, underscores that we have a much bigger problem with our government than just some of these details. They are trying to function as God. They want to regulate, as we saw here, worship. Bonnie Henry says, you don't have to go to church to worship God. Oh, she's the theologian in chief now. We all just need to submit and listen to whatever she decrees. No. We've got the state defining for us now what sexuality is and what is lawful and legit. I'm sorry, but God in the Decalogue addresses such issues. We've got the civil state inter interfering in matters of abortion and euthanasia, imposing those sorts of things upon us. They're the arbiters of life and death. We have a modern civil state that wants to be God. 
They want total planning and control. They want absolute sovereignty. And they want our fealty and our taxes. They want our fealty and our taxes so that they can do with us whatever it is they deem appropriate. The discussion of ethics has always been engaged in by theology, by religion, by philosophy. It's not ever been the arena for politicians who aren't particularly bright as it goes, but who as well are oftentimes wicked and vile with reference to their own code of personal ethics or conduct. And then ultimately, with reference to this rejection of the seventh commandment, not just in terms of society, but churches that jump on board and condone or uh, uh, get alongside of the, the sexual perversion, there's the judgment of God to be had. There is judgment. If this government or if this society never you know, punishes the, the various criminal offenders in our generation, God will deal with sexual perversion. God will deal with those who violate his law. And then the final thing I want to do is the use of the seventh commandment. Typically when we talk about the law of God, we know there's a threefold use. The civil use, the pedagogical use, and then the normative use. In terms of the civil use, listen to what Ursinus says in his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism at the point of the seventh commandment. He says, the magistrate should punish these heinous sins and abominable transgressions with extraordinary punishments. Wow. You mean we should actually think in terms of God's law when it comes to sexual ethics? Yeah. Greg Bonson wrote a book in the 70s on homosexuality. He said homosexuality that is publicly accepted is symptomatic of a society under judgment, inwardly corrupted to the point of impending collapse. Paul the Apostle regarded it as the most overt evidence of that degeneracy to which God in his wrath gave over the nations. Remember, as we're reading through the book of Leviticus, we have these prohibitions against sexual sin. Leviticus chapter 18, other chapters as well. Why? Because it was those sorts of things that the Canaanites did when they had tenure in the land. So God uses Israel to chasten them, to judge them, and to drive them out of the land. And so Israel is supposed to function in a proper capacity when it comes to sexual ethics in terms of the seventh commandment. They're not supposed to engage in adul uh, adultery. They're not supposed to fornicate. They're not supposed to be transvestites. They're not supposed to do all that stuff. So when they do continue down that road, it doesn't surprise us when God raises up Assyria to drive out the northern tribes, and later when he raises up Babylon to drive out the southern tribes. So Israel receives, by way of inheritance, this gift of God in terms of the land. But if they aren't faithful in the land, then that land is going to vomit them out, just like the land vomited out the Canaanites. And one of the telling issues with reference to Canaanite culture was sexual perversion sexual sin. Same sort of thing happens with reference to Israel and that's why God sends the prophets to preach to them and call upon them to repent, to forsake their sin. Now we live in a curious generation because none of the politicians typically give any concern whatsoever to commandments. They don't care about the sixth, vis-a-vis -vis abortion, euthanasia. They don't care about the seventh, vis-a-vis -vis let's mutilate or let's let little children mutilate themselves for the greater good of sexual freedom or whatever it is they think. And then as well with reference to theft. I mean, the whole government system in terms of the way we operate now is built on theft. They take our money and they give it to foreign countries. So we are in a deficit situation in terms of the, the, the civil polity in our land. But if we read the old boys, we read the old writers, in the 70s, 70s wasn't that long ago with Greg Bonson, he saw this coming, that when we see these kinds of things sanctioned, not only sanctioned, but encouraged, condoned, and oftentimes subsidized by the federal government, we are not in a good state. Whatever may be happening in terms of Canadian life, we look to be under the judgment of God. And therefore, we need to understand that we have to be faithful. We, ca we have to toe the line as God gave it to us. And we can't compromise at this level of sexual ethics when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ. So civil use, the, 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 the world, the, the, the society at large should embrace God's law. 
on. The pedagogical use, that means the law of God shows us our sin so that we see our need for the Savior. And certainly the seventh commandment does that. The seventh commandment gets right to the heart of a man. If you look upon a woman to lust, you've already broken the commandment in your heart. It's one of those commandments that gets right in there and presents itself on a regular basis. So it shows us our constant need and dependence upon our Lord Jesus Christ. And then as saved men and women, in terms of the normative use, we've already seen in 1 Thessalonians 4, the abstention from all sexual sin. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's the, the mandate for the people of God. Second, the practice of biblical marriage. If you're not married and you want to be married, prepare to get married. Find a woman. Find a man. The prevention of uncleanness is a good thing. So biblical marriage, and I mean, again, what God says in terms of marriage ought to be uh, uh, done by the people of God. And then the mortification of sin. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it far from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than and for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Jesus is speaking metaphorically. Origen, the church father, did not think so. Origen, I think, I think it was Origen, he was emasculated because of this command, because of this prohibition. I am not advocating anyone go out and emasculate themselves if they are struggling. He is speaking metaphorically. You're not supposed to engage in self-mutilation. Spurgeon says, let no man plead this literally and therefore mutilate his body as some foolish fanatics have done. And ultimately, brethren, if the heart's not dealt with, you're still going to sin the sin, right? You may cut off appendages, but if you haven't dealt with the heart, if you're not living in light of Proverbs 4, you might be there because we were just in Proverbs 6. Uh, Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, put perverse lips far from you, let your eyes look straight ahead, your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left, remove your foot from evil. But that mandate, verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. And then as well, the Lord highlights the need to deal radically with sin. That's the point. Not physically cut your hand off, not physically gouge out your eye, but rather deal radically with your sin. So he uses the metaphor to underscore the seriousness and to show how we ought to go about dealing with these particular things. Again, Spurgeon says, better a blind saint than a quick-sighted sinner. And then we need to recognize finally the close association between the two tables of the law. Typically, when we make maintain communion with God, it helps us in the second table commandments. If we are neglecting God, we neglect the first table, then our issues with the second table are going to be pretty palpable. Again, same sort of pattern when it comes to the prophets and Israel. The prophets would go in the name of God and, and, and preach to the people. And they would typically highlight first table sins that they had been idolatrous or they had been blasphemous or they had forgotten their God and then they deal with second table sins. So what's the point? If we're not walking in communion with our God, most likely we're not going to be treating our fellows with the respect and with the dignity that God calls us to treat them with. So there is a close correlation between the two tables of the law in terms of our obedience and compliance with reference to the normative use of the law. And then finally, I said, might have said finally, I had two finally. It's 1 Corinthians 6. We need to realize, as perverted as our culture is, the gospel is more powerful than the perversion. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 at verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of of our God.
So it is our blessed privilege to be able to preach a full and free gospel to all sinners everywhere, knowing that in Corinth there were those who had been guilty of these sins as a pattern of life, but they were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified freely by the grace of God Almighty. Well, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of the commandments. We thank you, Father, that our Lord Jesus came to live, to die, and to rise again so that we may have everlasting life. For certainly when we look into these commandments, when we start to, to go below the surface, we see that, that we have a problem with your law. We are lawbreakers and we lack conformity unto it. So we thank you for Christ. We thank you for the imputed righteousness of Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness of all of our sin. And God, we know that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit with us is able to help us to restrain our hearts, to restrain our minds when it comes to these particular these particular things things. Help us to be faithful and help us to glorify and honor you. And as a church, may we hold fast to the truth of God's holy word. We pray for the church as a whole all over the earth that she would hold fast as well with reference to the, to the Bible sexual ethics and to preach these things and, and, and to call sinners to faith and repentance. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, any questions or comments on any of those fun things? <laughs> hold up the, the spotlight of scripture on a culture like ours, but it's certainly um, uh, most applicable or um, um, appropriate topic for our consideration in light of our situation. Yes, sir. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the uh, ARPA did a presentation at Mount Cham. It was really well done. One of the guys from ARPA, they had a speaker, Jojo uh, Ruba, was speaking on this, uh, the Bill C-4 and these topics. And, Good. Just the statistics of I mean, where does it stop, right? Like, yeah. If you can identify you whoever you want, so why can't an old guy identify as a six year old in fact, there is a guy doing that? Exactly. Yeah. If that, then why not a dragon? If somebody doing that identifies a dragon. Yeah. But then coming back to the bill, it just really shows that there's really one way you can go towards all these other identities. But if you want to go back, there's no support. Yeah. So yeah. It's so biased. And, and that happens. Uh, apparently, the data suggests that there, there's a lot of regret. There's regret. You know, no support to go back. No counseling. Yeah. No, nothing. And the person is very much frustrated because no one tried to stop them. Yeah. No one, you know, everybody Must just said, sure, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Did you have something, John? Oh, no, just thinking about everything I said. It's, yeah. I, I think it's, uh, it was great uh, teaching from the scriptures because. You know, the trouble is nowadays, I believe, is that people avoid these things. It's almost like this wokeism is coming in. Well, it's a sensitive talk. Yeah, we can't it's talk not, about it. No, yeah. it, it's absolutely essential that we do it. Some people criticize for, I know. for people to speak in the church about that thing. And perhaps you probably receive criticism. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But as well as I can say, it's encouraging. Keep yeah. it up because it's absolutely necessary in our, our culture, I believe. Yeah, I think, I think the woke is, they're bullies. And the way to deal with a bully is to stand up to them. That's what I think, yeah. To, to, to John's point then, if not in church, if not by the Bible study, with an open Bible, an open confession, and a catechism, then when else? Yeah, when else right. are, are we supposed to deal with it? So again, this goes back to the seeker-sensitive stuff in the church world. Mm -hmm. We're so busy trying to attract unbelievers that we're going to be silent on basic ethical issues. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any of these mega church people raising the bell, mm -hmm. uh, raising the alarm. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about the Beatle issue, the kids, free transgenderism. Yeah. Now, other thing I'll quickly point out is philosophically, transgenderism follows from a postmodern view of metaphysics. What I mean by that, very simply put, is if I don't believe in absolute truth, if I'm not going to let the light of nature, meaning creation, male, female, in every species, as you said, millennia of science, uh, we're going to let a bunch of postmoderns now rewrite millennia of scientific consensus, mm -hmm. literally since the dawn of time. Yeah. Uh, so, so um, who gave these people all that cultural power mm -hmm. to literally rewrite the most basic facts of reality? Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's a, it's a, it's a re redefining of current is how they do it, right? They, you know, now they think gender to mean something different than, than sex. Right. So it's, I mean, you see it in the theological world, too, mm -hmm. right, where you kind of make your own definition, and it sounds good, but that's kind of seems, that's what they're doing, too, right? Just oh, yeah. make a definition and, and or redefine terms so that they can, it, you know, it doesn't, it's not so 
such an obvious contradiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it still is, but <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah it, you're just shouted down. You you yeah. dare not you know oppose them because you're the bad guy at that point. Well, I'm sorry, they're not you know the epitome of righteousness and virtue. <laughs> Being shouted down by by that ilk is that, that I would expect that. Yeah, it's definitely warfare, and it's definitely, I mean, it, it, at, at times it's quite discouraging to see how far they've gone and to see how many, you know, how much impact it has been made. Yeah, but just that number within a decade, a thousand percent increase in adolescent girls wanting to transition to boys. And, and as she points out, gender dysphoria typically is among two and three, four year olds. Adolescent, it was never heard of. Now, YouTube influencers, it's cool. And uh, testosterone, I'd like to do a couple of doses of testosterone. I see it 40 as a man. I couldn't get it. But if I was a 15 year old girl that wanted to, to transition, I'd get it like that. That's criminal. The results of it, I was looking at before and after in both directions, and it's just shocking. Like, just in a few months, a difference. Well, and with the girls, I mean, the, what Abigail Schreier points out is, you know, they've got all this pressure. I, I don't know, reading that book made me think the most difficult age group of ever to be, or ever to be, is an adolescent girl in North America. I mean, there's just a lot of pressure for that. But, but apparently there is a, 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 a well-being that comes even with a, a girl taking testosterone. It has that kind of a... Uh, an effect where there's something good about it. There's a confidence. There's a you know this kind of I want to do it some more. Interesting too though is that you know why why weren't we allowed to use hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin? At least according to them, it's because it was an off-label application, right? Hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin weren't made for COVID, so that's off-label. You can't, you can't take it for COVID. Do you think testosterone has an on-label directive to transition 15-year-old girls? See, they don't play by their rules or standards ever. It is not that we're dealing with some sort of a monolithic group that is consistent. The only thing they're consistent at is being inconsistent. You can, you can use testosterone to you know, mutilate a, a girl, um, but you can't take hydroxychloroquine to try to fight the, the flu. So this is where we're at, and they are you know, ramped up. So I think we need, to be know, we, we need to be knowledgeable of the texts and just seek to resist it. Yes, Corey. Just reading that book. One of the things that really stood out to me is how hard it is being a parent. Oh yeah. To oh a kid yeah. This age, like that book was such an eye opener. Yeah. That it was like, if I can find it, if anybody wants to read it, they can borrow it. Yeah, I have a copy too. Yeah. To yeah. 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 But yeah, it was. It, everything is against the parent who tries to help them oh, yeah. in the situation. Oh yeah. They just get a high off of starting their TikTok account, and that's their claim to fame for the next year exactly. or two. Exactly. And then it's over and then they crash. And then the parents need to deal with everything. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's, 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 it's horrible. And the fact that they tried to ban the book too. I had oh, no yeah. trouble trying to find, track it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was pretty much canceled as soon as she wrote the book. Yeah. Joe Rogan had her on and that helped. And then uh, I know Tucker had her on I one time too. Shapiro yeah, book. yeah, I think so too. But. But yeah, just an eye-opening, <laughs> eye-opening read on the situation. So. When, when, when did they? Like I always was under the impression that it was more the other way that it was the boys transitioning to the girls. But with your this staff, is the it's going this is the recent craze. That's why she calls the book the transgender craze seducing our daughters. She, she all but. I mean, it's peer pressure. You, you know, I, I, I heard another guy who's a psychologist that Rogan interviewed talking about, you know, we all know boys can bully, but not nearly as badly as girls. Was it, was it boys, boys can hit each other and violent. Girls destroy each other on social media. Apparently they're just nasty. They're more cliquey too. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what it is, you know. One friend does it, and then it's cool, so the next girl in the group oh, yeah. does it. Like, that's kind of how she explains it. It's all these friends it just becomes kind of a peer pressure thing and then these youtube influencers that have transitioned 
and they have the cool YouTube channel and they're usually well presented and you know happy and well adjusted and transitioning was the best thing I ever did. So you get you know some confused 14 year old that's done, you know getting picked on or whatever finds one of these things and then basically by the end of the book she's just saying it's a cult. It's, it's like a massive cult. The people within, not, not Abigail Schreier, but some of the people that were involved in it, young girls that got into, you know, they just saw it, it was cultic. You, you couldn't have a compelling, you couldn't have a contrary thought. You know, this, you've probably seen that J.K. Rowling is under, under attack. She's the, the author of the Harry Potter series. Well, she's a lesbian, but she believes women are women and men are men. Transgenders hate her because it, it's, what is the T-E-R-F? Uh, trans, trans... Exclusionary radical feminists. Yes, yeah. So if you think, if you're a lesbian, but you think men are men and women are women, you're a radical nut <laughs> in their realm. So, so the LGBTQ, they all don't get along, right? It's not like there's this harmonious little group of, you know, just doing their thing. There's a lot of hate on so, in in so, that little group. So firstly, in terms of psychologist, was it Jonathan Haidt? It was Jonathan Haidt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I yeah. watched Haidt's lectures. Yeah. Haidt has uh, lectured extensively, yeah. not only in those interviews, but elsewhere. Right. A lot of current person. He's talked a lot about how social media has driven suicide oh, yeah. among oh, yeah. teenage girls. More on that moment. But in terms of this, so there's a civil war, a well documented civil war between TERF, aka I would just suggest that these are second wave feminists from the 70s. Mm -hmm. This is the Roe versus Wade abortion feminists of the 70s. Mm -hmm. These are typically older middle-aged women just holding on to what they consider to be feminist orthodoxy, quote yeah. unquote, right. which I consider to be unnatural heterodoxy. Right. But but it, there's like feminist orthodoxy mm -hmm. and they're at war with transgenders. Exactly. Because transgenders are now attacking the definition of womanhood, the very definition of womanhood that they've spent 50 years That's fighting right. for. That's so you right. got civil war there, and yeah. they can't get on the same page. Yeah. But in terms of height, uh, so, okay, so suicide's up among the teenage girls, uh, the psychological warfare, psychological torture, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of bullying tactics, and uh, yeah, it's, it's gut-wrenching and horrifying. I was gonna ask the question then, so outside of the reform world, like, mm -hmm. what we hear tonight is not new. Mm -hmm. I've seen you present the deck a lot, I don't know, probably five to ten times mm -hmm. since I've been around in eight years. Mm -hmm. This is not new material at all, whatsoever. But, outside of the reform world, is there any discussion? So like, if, if the teenage girls, particularly those that are in the public school system, are facing an increased suicide risk, let's say, mm -hmm. because of social pressures and everything else we're talking about here, um, what is the response then across the board? And I mean, especially outside the reform, because I understand mm -hmm. in a circle like this, mm -hmm. I think the people around here are engaged, we're paying attention, we know what's going on, and I trust and hope that in the reform context, people are homeschooling and they're, mm -hmm. doing, they're taking measures mm -hmm. to mitigate social trends. But what are Christians doing? And is there not, it's not like this is debatable at the theological level. So is this to say that the evangelicals are now secular on basic I think there's been a blitzkrieg. I think the culture, the, the left has won. And they are just shoving it down our throats left, right, and center. I, that's my, they're, they're feeding us wokeism with, with fire hoses every moment of every day. And it gets tiring. It gets tedious. I mean, who wants to keep dealing with that? But we need to keep dealing with it, right? We can't capitulate. And I think there's this twisted Christian mindset that, well, we just need to spread the love of God. Yeah, repent, believe on the gospel. That's spreading the love of God. Not go ahead and transition because, you know, God's going to love you anyway. That, that, that's just not, that's not the way we're supposed to address these things. Yes. You know, we're also living in a generation that is one generation away from going, not going to church anymore. Oh, yeah. Like all our grandparents went to church. There's a generation between that didn't go to church but still knows the biblical. Yeah. And now we're at a generation where, so I think that's that too. If I have to think, if I was not a Christian, I would probably think that all this transgender, not not the the transgenders, but the LGBTQ. I probably 
probably from a secular standpoint be like, well, yeah, that's okay because I don't have any reason not to. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also what's driving a lot of that whole left. Mm -hmm. there, there is no basis. So how do you argue yeah. with it? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean the you know it's I guess the absurdity too you know the 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 more they shoot us with that fire hose the more we're just trying to keep our heads above water I, I really think it's it's inundated it, it's just, it's been both barrels for however long and the left seems to have captured you know all levels of of culture and society and we're having to play catch up and. I just don't think we're as vicious or as vile as they are. They seem to be a lot more well ordered or connected. They seem to stick together and they seem to, you know, hey, this is the agenda and this is how we're going to get there. I mean, it's diabolical, but they're effective at it. So, so where's the boycott to see? In all seriousness, I think that's the boycott Disney movement. Yeah. It's going on. I, I'm on right Twitter. I, I like right Twitter. There's a lot of good stuff going on there. You know, that's, that's what I, where I see encouragement. I see a lot of pro-life. I see a lot of condemnation of abortion and condemnation of Disney. Um, I know people personally that have canceled any connection or any desire to, to support Disney. As far as I'm concerned, they're not getting any of my loonies. This uh, is all, he said too that he's in, they're the government. Get all kinds of oh yeah, DeSantis is going to cut them off there. Yeah. See, that's what we, we need a, an army of DeSantises. We could call them the DeSanti. The more <laughs> just send them into every state, let them clean house, and then he can come up here to Canada and be our be our ruler. <laughs> Yeah. Boys. And I remember back an incident, incidents that happened in Detroit with a young girl. It was under the guise, I don't know if I ever heard what was behind it, but of, of being bullied. But they actually drug her into the harbor there in Victoria and drowned her. And it was it was all over the news for a while. And I don't know what ever came of that, but I can't remember her name. Yeah, Bert, yeah. Bert, yeah. Bert. Mm. Bert. How old was she? And there was a group of these girls, young girls from school, and they they Alice. Who? Alice. Oh, yeah. Hmm. It was just brutal. You know, they they they, they killed her. They yeah. murdered her. Oh, it's yeah. It's not a not a nice world for a teenage girl at this point. Well, or, this was ten years ago. That's hmm. like, oh, this is just new. This not is brand new. new. Yeah. Yeah, when? Were some of you? We got we got the gospel. Yeah, the answer is not go go change what you're wearing or take off your makeup, mm -hmm. whatever. But mm -hmm. it's, it's not believe on the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. But, yeah, you got to earn trust and build relationships. And all yeah. those things along the Good night, Corey. Okay. Do you have one more comment? Yeah, we don't have to. We don't have to go to the end of the ditch and embrace their ideas mm -hmm. like the Addisons and. That will stick. The whole crap of mankind. Oh no. These people are unstable. Oh no. So no, no, I don't believe that. Right. That's just to say that I think that's the temptation. There's, there's other people in the Christian world or the sub-Christian world that go not see other people. Right. Yeah. Like and, that. Um, yeah. Get, get it over. Good night. <laughs>